Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste So now we have gone into who is Tripura Sundari so we can get back to the story and we know who we're talking about. We already introduced Parashuram, that Parashuram heard from his gurus and as a result he received this knowledge. So now, this is later on, and Parashuram has become a guru himself and he's approached by his disciple Sumedha. Now, remember, these names are all codes, right? Sumedha means very intelligent, expert, having a correct understanding. So Sumedha, the intelligent one, approaches his guru, Parashuram, and he says, O ocean of compassion for the helpless, what is the supreme remedy that brings good results and well-being? O oh, excellent Brahmana, it is said that the compassionate gurus reveal even the most secret knowledge. Teach that to me if I deserve to receive it. So, oh, there's so many wonderful points. <laughs> in this little shloka. So the main thing is that this whole book, all 800 and something big size pages, takes place within the context of a conversation between a guru and his disciple. And you'll find all of the Vedic, Puranic, and Upanishadic texts have this feature. It's a literary device, yeah. It gives an excuse for a dialogue, a premise for an exchange of uh, queries and answers. But it also illustrates something very, very important in spiritual life. One must have a guru, not just a book, not just some videos, but a real, live, <laughs> breathing, flesh and blood human being. Now, the reason for this is not that one should become, how can I say, uh, a victim of somebody else's megalomania, huh? which happens in religious organizations. There's no doubt about it. You have to be very careful who you select as a guru but so that you can be in the guru's energy field. The guru, if he's authentic, is a realized being. So you have to be in the energy field of a realized being to understand what he's talking about. Huh? It's just like some people want me to initiate them in Gayatri Mantra. And I say, okay, show up here in India and I'll do it. Huh? Well, why is that? Because I've realized Gayatri Mantra. <laughs> and I can pass that realization on to you. But somebody who hasn't realized it, for whom it's just a, a text or just a practice, can't give you that same level of understanding, insight. Huh? I'll tell you what happened. I remember that very clearly, it was two years ago, almost exactly. And I was chanting Gayatri Mantra. Now, I had been initiated in Gayatri Mantra myself over 30 years ago. When was it exactly? 1976 or 77. So it was maybe 30, 40 years ago. And I had chanted it formally. But I never really chanted it as a devotional exercise, as devotional service. 
until very recently, until I came to Tiruvannamalai two years ago. And uh, also I was chanting it in the wrong meter and, and so many things. So I finally got, got my act together, did my background studies and started chanting it properly. And I was chanting it night and day huh? from the moment I woke up in the morning until falling asleep at night with my beads in my hand. So what happened after about two weeks of this and, and doing intense yoga during the day out in the sun? Um, you know that feeling when you're just about to have an orgasm, you have like, like uh, how can I explain it? Like a, a feeling of energy moving in your legs. Uh -huh. And then usually that feeling gets concentrated in the genitals and then explodes in an orgasm. But this time it went up through my whole body all the way to the top of my head. Woo! <laughs> Better than any orgasm. <laughs> That's the realization of Gayatri. How will you get that just by watching a video or reading a book? It's not possible. You have to do the practice and you have to be in the presence of a realized being, someone who actually has the realization of Gayatri. Then the same is true of this Sri Vidya also. Now Sumedha, who's very intelligent, right? Sumedha, that's what it means. He addresses his guru. He asks his guru, what is the supreme remedy we're all suffering here in the world. And we try different remedies, huh? economic, social, political, and so on and so on, huh? to, to reduce or eliminate our suffering. And maybe they work a little bit, but they don't completely remove it. They don't make us fearless. They don't make us free from suffering. So Sumedha isn't asking about any of that stuff. He's asking, what is the supreme remedy? That which eliminates all suffering forever. That's his inquiry. And it's really interesting because a little bit later on, we find that he had asked Parashuram this same question 17 years earlier. But Parashuram didn't answer them. So he goes on to say, teach that to me if I deserve to receive it. In other words, if I have the adhikar, if I have the qualification. Apparently, when he had inquired the same question 17 years earlier, he didn't have the qualification to receive it. So why should the guru waste his breath? Now, I know most of you people out there watching this don't have a guru, don't do regular sadhana, don't follow any regulative principles, <laughs> have a very, very sketchy background as far as Vedic knowledge in general. And so most of this stuff is going to go right over your head. I'm sorry, you know, why? Because you don't have the adhikar, you don't have the qualification. So let's take a look at our chart again. I'm going to show you the original chart of the four darshanams. Pashus are the animalistic people. Dvaita Vadas are the dualistic religionists. Vishishta Dvaitas are the bhaktas, the real bhaktas practicing spontaneous love of God. The Vivartavadis are those who are practicing Raja Yoga, uh, meditating on emptiness to clear out the mind. And the Ajatavadis are the ones who have realized Brahman. Now, in the second column, you'll see their qualification. For the Pashus, their qualification is Manda, which means useless. <laughs> They're just Monday. There's no good for anything spiritual. But they are greater than 90% of the population. And they're called Chandalas. Chandala actually means dog eater. 
And if you go to an oriental country like Vietnam or China, people actually eat dogs. And if you go to Chinese restaurants anywhere in the world, you've probably had dog meat. So that's because <laughs> these are the lowest of mankind. Huh? And, and if, you, if you guys in America didn't have beef, huh? if you hadn't already uh, committed 75% of the world's arable land to raising feed for beef cattle, then <laughs> you would probably be eating dogs too. Because the taste for meat is the qualification of a pashu, an animalistic human being. Then the Dwaitavadis, they are engaged in actual religion. They're actually worshiping God. They're actually performing some yoga. And I don't mean hatha yoga, doing exercises and standing on your head. I mean real yoga, which is a connection with the Supreme. They're doing worship. They're doing ceremonies. They're chanting mantras. But they're chanting them as regulative principles, not out of spontaneous love. They're doing it as a duty because their, their guru told them. Then the Vishishta Dwaitans are those who have raised up to the next level where their performance of bhakti is now spontaneous, not out of duty, not because of instructions, but because of taste, because of love. Huh? This is real bhakti. Any kind of bhakti that's performed on regulative principles is actually karma yoga. And uh, it's not the same taste at all. But then above them are the Tivra Adhikaris. Tivra means ripe. Those who are ripe, huh, who have gone through all the regulative principles, developed spontaneous bhakti, and cleansed the mind of all the negative materialistic garbage. They're ripe. They're ready for the real sadhana. What is the real sadhana? Realization of Brahman. So they learn the uh, Vedanta and they practice Raja Yoga. That's their symptom. And that leads to realization of Shunya. By the way, you, should, you know, at some point you should stop this video when the chart is on the screen. Take a screenshot and study it. Because this chart is the key to so many things, so many important understandings about spiritual life. So finally, when one finishes that sadhana, his qualification becomes atitivra. Atitivra means fully ripe, like a fruit. When it's fully ripe, it drops from the tree all by itself. Similarly, the ajatavadins, when they uh, realize Brahman, then they're finished with all regulative principles, religious ceremonies, practices, and so on. They're in the post-meditation stage. So because of this, uh, they are the real Brahmanas. Huh? Brahmana means one who lives in Brahman. To live in Brahman, you have to realize Brahman. If you haven't realized Brahman, maybe you're a Brahmana in training. Uh, maybe a Brahmana by birth, but not a real Brahmana, not a real realized Brahmana. We're talking about those who have realized Brahman, and they are just a tiny, tiny fraction of the population. They're the ones who are the qualified gurus, and this is the qualification of Parashuram. Parashuram has realized Brahman. And therefore, he replies to Sumedha from that platform. Commanded by Shiva, Dattatreya transferred to me that entire knowledge containing bhakti and jnana, the Tripura Rahasya, which was embedded in his pure heart. This glorious text, replete with divine lore, glory, devotion, and ardor, is the Supreme Tantra. Wow. So the entire knowledge 
of bhakti and jnana was given to Parashuram, he practiced it and realized it. So therefore he can speak on Tripura Sundari, the secret of the goddess of the three worlds. See, this is so deep. So one should have a spiritual master and one should be in dialogue with the spiritual master like this to develop the qualifications to hear this supreme Tantra. Tantra is not for everybody. In fact, most of what is uh, called Tantra is not really Tantra at all. It's just an excuse for sexual gratification, indulgence of the senses. So real Tantra is always religious. It's always oriented towards some god or goddess, some form of the divine. And its result is to transfer our existence to that world, to the world of that particular god or goddess in the next life, and or actually even now. Huh? One develops a consciousness of that plane of existence, even in the present life. The example is given of a plant worm. You ever see these little like caterpillar-like uh, plant worms? They have two sets of legs, one in the front, one in the back, six or eight legs. So when they want to change from one leaf or one branch to another, they, they keep their back end on the old branch and they reach with their front end and grasp the other, the new branch, pull themselves up. Okay, this is the example given how the plant worms transfer themselves from one branch to another is exactly how the yogi transfers himself from one loka, one world, to another. It requires a change in consciousness. And of course, the methods that work on consciousness have to be given by a guru. Not any guru, but a qualified guru, a realized guru. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to make any real progress. You're going to maybe... Uh, execute the form of the yoga, but not the result, not the content, the essence, the real substance of the yoga. This has to be given through the guru. The guru has to be himself realized in that way. And then he can act as an anchor, as the second branch huh? that you attach yourself to and pull yourself up. See, I, I'm speaking from experience. I served my Adi Guru for over 30 years. And I realized that level of existence through him. It's, I'll tell the story very quickly. I had re just retired from business in 2001. I went to Hawaii, the island of Kauai, which is very beautiful. And I was camping out near a, a beach in a beautiful forest, which had previously been a bird sanctuary. And so there were all kinds of amazing, exotic, tropical birds. And uh, in this atmosphere, I was chanting my mantra, Hare Krishna mantra. And I was chanting day and night, minimum 64 rounds a day for like months. Huh? Just camped out, living very simply. And so one morning, Krishna came to me in a dream. And he said, you will attain me very soon. And of course, that's what happened. <laughs> so now we are in a position to share this with others. But you have to have the Adi car. Go back and look at the chart. You have to have the Adi car, which is developed by doing the lower practices. Then you are qualified to receive the knowledge for the higher practices. Otherwise, I could give the knowledge, or you can read it in a book, but it won't stick. It'll go in one ear and out the other. You won't really understand it because you don't have the background. You don't have the context to get the meaning. So... 
From the beginning of this series, seven years ago, we started on the level of Pashu, with our series called Being in the World. One who is a Pashu experiences various kinds of suffering. And the moment he begins to question that suffering, he begins to go up the path. And so we went through all these four, five levels on the chart in our series over seven or eight years, culminating in the series based on Ramana Maharshi's teachings. Those are about the Ajatta platform, and they're given on the Vivarta platform. Try to understand all this, because without the proper qualification, the guru cannot give you, even though he may wish to, uh, he cannot give you the higher knowledge. It won't set, it won't stick. You won't be able to apply it. So go back, look at this chart, memorize it, huh? because we're going to be characterizing the different episodes in this book according to the level of the teaching they represent. So if you want to re really want to know what we're talking about, <laughs> you have to understand that these four levels of spiritual qualification. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.